joining us. Um, I'm Lina Marie. Um, I'm a new addition to the Stanley Burton Centre. Um, I'm a, an early career Lee Hume uh, Fellow here. Yes. Um, and uh, today is the first session of a two-pronged um, seminar, uh, which is jointly organised by the Stanley Burton Centre for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and the European Centre for Minority Issues in Flensburg, Germany. Um, so the Stanley Burton Centre um, is the oldest centre for Holocaust studies in the UK um, and has uh, been organising um, a lot of activities, uh, uh, successful lectures, seminars, uh, has an annual conference. Uh, so you can follow the, the activity of the centre on um, on the internet. Um, first of all, I would like to quickly uh, talk about the format of this workshop. So the way we'll go about it, we'll have some presentations, uh, and then we'll take the questions, comments, suggestions, thoughts at the very end. And we also invite people um, who might be actually following us on, on the internet to um, you know, to, to send uh, their questions by email or just by, by, by tweet, um, basically. My presentation today is not going to be a paper proper, but rather the sort of background presentation that creates some sort of a, you know, um, uh, let's say, um, coherent narrative so that people understand where all of your papers actually fit in. Um, so you will have to excuse um, uh, things, commonsensical things that I will point out. This is just for the sake of, of the audience, basically. Um, and one last thing that I would like to point out is that even if this is um, in name an, yeah, a workshop on anti-Semitism, this is not supposed to be on, only on anti-Semitism. So doing anti-Semitism without looking at the rest of the population without looking at the, the whole state, at the whole system, is a bit like trying to clap with one hand, not quite succeeding. Um, so it will inevitably be about relationships between minorities and majorities. Um, it will be about you know, state building, the, the, the sort of anxieties of national identity, and also about this, this um, mental um, reflex that people still have nowadays of criminalising a whole community, either for no reason whatsoever, or for the sins of a few. So you see it done again and again nowadays. Um, so I think yeah, this is this is something that, that we will we will touch on in, uh, in our presentations. Um, once again, for the sake of um, of the audience who might be watching this online, I'm just going to put. Yeah, put up the, um, the map of present-day Romania and Moldova. Um, this is what the two countries look like nowadays. Yeah, they're on the border of the EU. One country, Romania, inside the EU. The other one, knocking on the doors of the EU. Outside has just signed an agreement um, with, uh, with the European Union. The map I will be talking about is slightly different. It looks more like, like this. Um, and, and basically, this is the map, you know, going back to, to, to the First World War, before the First World War. Um, why is this region interesting? Um, I will be following the triple frontier between Romania, the Habsburg Empire, or Austria-Hungary by, by that time, and Tsarist and Tsarist Empire. Now, this region is interesting, not only intrinsically, uh, but also because it is on the fault line of three empires virtually, or at least up until 1878, theoretically, it constituted the meeting point of three empires. Um, from the point of view of, of attitudes towards the Jewish population, the Ottoman Empire was by far the, the most accommodating the Tsar is increasingly you know, oppressive across the, uh, across the 19th century, and the Habsburg Empire gradually emancipatory. Now, once 
again, for the sake of, of a broader audience, uh, not for the sake of the, of the people present here, this is a chart with changes that took place um, across the, the 19th century. Um, and what we need to remember is that the two countries nowadays kind of trace their origins back to two principalities, Wallachia and Moldavia. Um, and what is nowadays Moldova, Republika Moldova, is actually a splinter with infinite variations throughout the 20th century of, of one of these principalities. Now, yeah, to, to make things a little bit more uh, friendly, audience friendly, um, I put together some maps. Um, you will have to excuse my cartographic skills, which are um, very bad indeed. But what I'm trying to point out is how the region actually changed. Um, so in the 18th century, when there was still a Poland out there, um, you had two principalities under Ottoman suzerainty. So they were not completely integrated in the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, uh, but they were still uh, dependent on it. By the end of the century, Poland is wiped off the map, and um, the sort of northern and eastern part of the Principality of Moldavia get, gets chipped off. So you have Bukovina going to the Habsburgs, um, and by 1812, Bessarabia, that is the eastern part of, of uh, the Principality of Moldavia, goes to the Tsarist Empire. The Crimean War hives off the southern counties of Bessarabia back to the Principality of Moldavia. Um, in 1859, you get this union, personal union between the two principalities, so that they end up looking like this. After the Russo-Turkish War and the Treaty of Berlin, you, you end up with an independent Romania, completely free from the Ottoman Empire, um, but the southern region of Bessarabia goes back to the to the Russians. So yeah, this is this is roughly the, the, the story of territorial change. Very schematic, very sketchy, so that there's lots to say about every every one of these changes. What was the Jewish legal status around the border? Well I tried to actually encapsulate it in like few words. So I, I'm actually using Austria-Hungary as some sort of a term of comparison because they are right across the border and what they do is completely different. So I think I would term the Tsarist Empire treatment of their Jews as segregation. Yeah, they build a pale of settlement uh, which kind of ebbs and, and, and sort of uh, wanes uh, throughout the 19th century. Um, in Romania, I am tempted to, I mean, what, what happens in Romania is something along the lines of Alba Nagra, that is, the, the, the authorities try hard not to emancipate while pretending to emancipate. Um, so, yes, they, they're forever shirking emancipation, whereas across the border in Austria-Hungary, you get full emancipation, full citizens' rights, um, which is based on a coincidence of interest. Now, I will quickly go through, uh, through the next slide on Bessarabia because uh, Andre will join us and he will actually talk more about, uh, about the, uh, the condition of Jews in Bessarabia. Um, so, as we know, the Tsarist Empire acquires its, its, its greatest intake of Jewish population after the, uh, the partitions of, of Poland. And this, this actually coincides with the, the setting up of the, the Pale of Settlement. Um, the segregation that they opt for is not entirely watertight, and I'm sure that um, uh, Andre can tell us more about this. The Jewish population mid-century ends up being um, sort of um, hived off with the foreigners in the empire. <coughs> Uh, but they are a special category of foreigners that, because they can't evolve out of that category, whereas all the others can. Now, Bessarabia is um, gradually sort of um, introduced into the pale, and the population, the Jewish population, between 1812 and 1897 actually uh, increases tenfold. By the end of the century, beginning of the, of the 20th century, 
through state condoned violence and just an administrative neglect, you know, schlamperei, I think that's, that's the, the best word, um, and lots of sort of encouragement from, from other quarters, you end up with full-blown pogroms, uh, like the 1903 Kishinev pogrom. Once again, um, Andre is going to tell us all about that. Romania, I think, yeah, for Romania, the best description um, you know, is, is actually captured in, in this Dobrojan Gera quote, where, where he says, well, he met this, this, uh, this person, this foreigner, who, who jokingly said, well, I don't think you know, Romania has any Jews. Well, in order to have someone uh, in a country, they need to be citizen of that country. And I think that, that illustrates very well the status of, of uh, Jews in, in Romania. Now, just a few figures. Um, in 1899, the Jews represented 4.5% uh, of the population, uh, but they were unevenly spread. So the bulk of the population was in the, in the Moldavian uh, part of the country. One basic, thing to, 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 one basic thing to mention is the fact that state consolidation, so <laughs> creating, yeah, passing laws, creating institutions, went hand in hand with anti-Semitic legislation. So you have the, the, um, uh, the organic statutes, the, the Le reglements organique given by the, by the Russians, and then later on the, the 86 constitution and subsequent legislation that one way or another introduce limitations, uh, they actually, they legislate the forwardness of the Jews and also their deleterious harmful influence, which is even worse. Um, so in Romania, the, the Jewish question is usually part of a tug of war between external pressure, uh, that is the, the stipulations of the Treaty of Berlin, uh, that all minorities uh, in the new countries need to, uh, to, to enjoy full citizen rights. Um, the, the sort of jarring French and German model um, in, within, within Romania and then uh, various uh, uh, instances of, of political factionalism. What happens is that in the end, uh, Romanian statesmen opt for this case-by-case -case naturalization. So yes, uh, the Jews can apply for citizenship, but you know, we'll think twice before we actually grant it, uh, but only case-by-case, -case, not as a community, um, which results in this sort of three-pronged uh, type of, uh, of legal category. So you could have Full citizens, uh, more often than not, they were not Jews. Very few Jews had actual citizenship. Uh, then you had foreign Jews, that is, Jews with Austro-Hungarian citizenship, for instance, or belonging to another state. And then you had the limbo stage, the limbo category of, of just native Jews who were subjects but not citizens. So they were somewhere kind of stranded. And I just selected here two. Um, two quotes out of a myriad of positions, sort of Romanian positions on the Jewish question. One comes from uh, the sort of liberal doyen, uh, Dimitri Bratianu, and I selected it just because it, it's just so striking um, in the fact that he is having a go at the Jewish community in Romania, um, but also at the German community. So this, presumably, this must have been before uh, Germany unified, because he says, well, just like the Jews, the Germans have no fatherland. Um, but what, what strikes me about it is that he reproaches here the Germans with, with this notion that they work too hard and they work as poor. In other words, they work and we get poor in the process. Now, this was not uh, happening in a complete vacuum. It was you know, in the context of, of this uh, major scandal, the, the Strusberg affair, regarding uh, building railways in Romania by, by a German company and the Romanian state having to, to buy the whole network when the, when the whole thing goes, goes bankrupt. Um, but he is not alone in actually pointing out this, uh, this sort of deleterious foreign, especially German influence, uh, you have an 1872 Journalist Congress, um, which actually says that, you know, 
the Germans basically are, are a bad influence, they're trying to colonize the, the country, and the Jews are their vanguard here. At the other end of the, of the spectrum, of the political spectrum, so we've looked at, at one of the liberals, um, there is, uh, of course, the, um, the conservative Petre Kahn, um, who has a very simple solution for this. I mean, he, his basic point is that this is all about labor competition. Um, if you want to solve the, the Jewish question, what you need to do is to work as hard as the Jews, be as thrifty, as moderate as them, and then yeah, you will have solved, yeah, solved your problem. So yeah, this is just to give you a very sketchy taste of some of the opinions. Uh, I'm sure that yeah, people like you know, Raoul uh, are going to, to enlarge on this. Um, Austria-Hungary, which I mentioned briefly, I think actually creates a very, very um, interesting contrast because you have just across the border. So, when, so when all, all of this repress, repressive legislation was was the case in the Tsarist Empire, in in Romania, just across the border, just across the mountains, you have full emancipation. Full emancipation since 1867. That is since the monarchy split into two, and they they became. Uh, constitutional of sorts. Um, the evolutions are different and the reasons for emancipation and, and uh, the, that coincidence of interest uh, that I mentioned earlier are, are different. Um, in the Austrian half of the monarchy, the Jews assimilate to, to this German Kulturnation. That is, they, they do not become ethnic Germans, they assimilate to the big cosmopolitan German culture. Um, and they are yeah, among the most faithful sort of Habsburg uh, uh, loyalists. In Hungary, um, you get full emancipation, but for different reasons. The Jews are very useful um, because they Magyarize instantly. They are a literal community. You know, they, they are very good from an economic point of view. They will actually kickstart the economy for you. So there's this very happy sort of coincidence of, of uh, state purposes, as it were. In both cases, and I won't get into details because I don't have the time, um, this so-called full integration is actually only, uh, let's say, um, asymptotic. That is, you know, this um, emancipation only gets as far, but anti-Semitism exists in both halves of the monarchy. Um, now, and I would like to, to wrap up um, and just, you know, um, kind of throw the gauntlet at you, as it were. Um, maybe some of the things that we could consider in, in, in our interventions, in, in, in our comments, um, are, you know, first of all, you know, the sources of anti-Semitism, but not as hatred against the Jewish community only, but also as animosity against the community and how that community actually responds. How, how is it that people actually start hating a community en masse? Um, then, this is yeah, one, one of my sort of favorite, uh, let's say, expressions. Uh, it comes from, from yeah, the, the German world, yeah, the debate as to who actually said it first. But maybe one, one point to consider when we consider the, the economic side of things is to what extent anti-Semitism uh, or any of this type of community hatred, as it were, is stupid people's um, you know, socialism. That is, you, you get ordinary people realizing there's something wrong economically, but the only explanation they can come with, or they care to come with, is that, oh, it's the Jews, or it's the immigrants, and so on and so forth. Um, now, you know, is anti-Semitism a symptom of deeper running social, political malaise? To what extent is it a, a smoke screen or, or, or even a, um, a blindfold um, for bigger, more complex problems? So if you think of 1907 and how the, the peasant uprising started in Romania as just Jew bashing, uh, by the time the authorities realized that the, the peasants were not after the, the Jews, it was too late. Um, also, anti-Semitism as national envy, to echo a Freudian envy, as it were, or as some sort of a violent symbolic demarcation <coughs> of the nation. 
Um, and you know, maybe towards the end, consider what these increased levels of intercommunity hatred actually tell us about the society as a whole. You know, about citizen rights, about the nature of the state, um, and and the legal framework um, in place. Um, and you know, but the first and maybe last question is: Whenever we consider all of these individual cases, for whom does the bell toll? Does it only toll for them? 